is, uh, is it possible for America to get good leadership? Are we always um, <clears throat> going to be having, do we have to always have bad leadership? Uh, are others uh, in control of our nation and putting the wrong people in power that, you know, that wouldn't help America? I think that's been a, a case, a uh, part of it. But uh, we've had recently two or three things that have come out that have really uh, grabbed my attention. And one is uh, this, uh, uh, this dream and revelation from uh, La, uh, Lana Vosser. And, uh, and she says she had a dream regarding the United States election, and she calls it a call to prayer. And she said, Firstly, I want to preface this word by saying I do not have a political agenda for the United States of America. I am simply one person in Australia who has a huge heart of love for this beautiful nation and to see the destiny of the United States established and the king kingdom of God extended, releasing a huge wave of revelation of his goodness and love. I also want to say that I do not base what I am about to share on any policies that I have heard, but simply what I believe the Lord revealed to me in a dream concerning the candidates. This word is not in any way to sway anyone in their political views, but simply to release a revelation from the Lord that I believe needs to be covered in prayer. I had a dream recently where I was in a political arena and I saw Donald Trump and he was passionately putting forward his policies. In this dream, I could not hear what he was saying. I just remember seeing him speaking with great passion. Suddenly, I was lifted up above the United States of America and I saw the nation as if it was uh, if I was looking at a map written across the United States of America was the word Trump in big letters as I looked at this word suddenly the letters began to rearrange and the word went from Trump to triumph Amen. Oh. I then heard the Lord speak loudly in my dream Trump shall <coughs> lead the United States of America into triumph as I was waking up out of the dream, I heard the words, Trump shall lead the United States of America into victory. As I came to typing this dream, I heard the words, angels of triumph have been assigned to Trump. I believe the Lord is inviting us to seek his heart and to partner with him in prayer to see the United States of America brought back into a place of godly victory and triumph in whichever way that manifests. I am simply releasing that which was released to me, standing with you in prayer, my friends in the United States of America, uh, Lana uh, Vass Vosser. So she has this dream. Now she's, uh, she's had some positive dreams for America in the past, uh, but uh, this, jo this jives with, uh, with uh, 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 Kim Clement's word uh, that uh, the Lord is going to give Trump a trumpet. And he prophesied that. 2008. Was it? 10. 10, 10 or 2010, 11, something like whatever it was back in that period of time. He's going to give Trump a trumpet. Now, uh, Kim is, uh, we need to continue to pray for Kim. He still uh, uh, isn't able to function after his uh, stroke. stroke. Uh, and so. Uh, we have, we have, we're getting to see some kind of thing coming. Uh, even though uh, Trump has some rough edges to him, you might say, you know, he's got some rough edges. Uh, it, it appears to have a, to take a person with rough edges to get anything done. Absolutely. If you're a politician, you're not getting anything done that me it's meaningful to America. You might get something done that's meaningful to the uh, the money matters world ru ru rulers that are over us. Then, uh, then our friend Lance Walno uh, came out with his uh, uh, something he posted on his Facebook site, and I wanted to read this. It's three or four pages long, but we have to get the sense and feel of the whole thing. Uh, and it's called "My Unusual Saturday with Trump" by Lance Walno on, on October the twelfth, twenty fifteen. Uh, it's called "The Gospel in Black and White." A week after our meeting at Trump Towers, which he had a meeting with Trump there, I wrote my two articles and went back to business. Honestly, I was trying to get away from politics. <laughs> then I got a call from the pastor of New Spirit Revival in Cleveland, Ohio, 
Pastor Darrell was at the meeting we had in, 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 in New York uh, Trump Towers and asked, will your door still be open after the political process is, is over? Uh, uh, Darrell had asked Trump this question. You're open now, you want our vote, you know. Is your door going to still be open to us after, if you're elected president? That's, he's asking that question. Christian you, leaders usually, uh, usually get forgotten after an election. Trump gestured around the room at this gathering and replied, nobody will control who I meet with. Just like I'm meeting with you now, the door stays open. Pastor Darrell uh, took him at his word and reached out in an unusual way, inviting some 50 other Amer African American pastors to meet with Trump in Atlanta during his rally yesterday on October the 11th, 2015. Aligning with Trump has a price. This original New York trip to meet Trump came at a price for some of the black ministers. They told me they received a lot of hate mail, Uncle Tom stuff, from those who, who, uh, that do not approve of clergy breaking rank with the Democratic Party. Darrell Howe is undaunted by this. He sees a, a window of potential change coming in with, with Mr. Trump. The after African American church is the anchor of stability in America's most challenging cities. It has been surprising to many black pastors who supported President Obama that so little was done for their communities over the last past eight years. What particularly caught m many of them off guard was promoting President Obama in their congregations only to be embarrassed by his most militant policy advance, homosexual rights. Yeah. That didn't go down well as black churches are more conservative yeah. on, on such matters. While not being vocal, many leaders are rethinking a whole lot of things. If Democrats have, have failed them on one side of the aisle, on the other side, Republicans have been equally ineffectual. What would they put uh, their uh, hope in Donald Trump? Would they, would they, uh, why would they put their hope in Donald Trump? Because he is not your typical Republican, which works great because Pastor Darrell and his peers are not your typical African-American clergy. This is a story worth following as Darrell and I talked about the potential of real faith-based based initiatives in restoring communities I felt our hearts join. Isn't that like Jesus? Only Jesus can take two men, one white and one black, and join them with one heart for one cause in one conversation. If you want to see uh, what God is doing, go look. Since Donald Trump has already was already scheduled to go to Atlanta uh, Trade Center on Saturday, Pastor Darrell invited me to join him and his peers to meet with Trump. Off I went. I arrived at the Atlanta Trade Center at 10 a.m. on Saturday morning. Uh, it was my first Trump rally, and the crowd was coming in, soon to be about 10,000. There I was, the lone, well-dressed white guy uh, among equally well-dressed African-American clergy and their wives, all invited by Pastor Darrell. Then he has a strange TV interview. Before I knew it, a local TV station pulled me in front of a camera and introduced me. Here's the architect behind the Trump Organization, Mr. Trump's executive vice president and special counsel. Shoving a microphone in front of me, he continued, here's his lawyer and spokesman, Michael Cohen. There on live TV, I explained, I am not Michael Cohen. I am Lance Waldo. I'm with the clergy meeting with, uh, with Mr. Trump. Being the sole white guy with a partially Jewish background must have confused the man interviewing me. <laughs> The fact that I know Trump's attorney, Michael Cohen, made the experience especially funny. <laughs> what I said on air was somewhat surprising to me. I told them, Donald Trump is anointed in this season to break things open. Like Jeremiah of old, he has an assignment to tear down and to uproot and to plant. He has broken up a demonic cartel of political correctness, and now it's up to you and me, each of us, to move forward in our own sphere and knock down the obstacles that are silencing us and holding us back from what we are called to say and do. So here you are, you're on live TV, and the microphone is stuck in front of your face, and you give that, that blow, that blow is, but we have to be ready with a word in season. We never know when the Lord might have you say something. Uh, I had not thought about it too much earlier, but I believe Trump is carrying a mantle that if aligned with the right way, catalyzes the courage to speak the truth You've, you've been afraid to say. Uh, after this interview, we were taken to an area constructed of blue curtains fixed in a temporary frame, like an Arabian tent walled off part of the convention center. We were so close to the stage area, it was difficult to talk because of the music. 
Herman Cain was getting ready to speak. The moment Trump came through the door, the whirlwind came with him. Security, media, staff all rushed into our curtained room. Trump's presence filled the space quickly. He warmly greeted the pastors and thanked them for coming to meet him prior to speaking. He apologized for the tight schedule and the rush time with him. Not having a microphone, he motioned with his arms and invited everyone to come close and hu uh, like a football huddle. He threw his arms around the men near him and leaning in repeated his appreciation for the reception and told them it means a lot to me. Then he pointed out that he had to go next door and do an impromptu media event for MSNBC, ABC, CBS, etc. Trump, who does not work with scripts or a teleprompter, simply improvised the next moment, much to the consternation of his security detail. <laughs> with a mischievous glint in his eye, he said, what do you say we do this media thing together? You all come with me and stand with me on the platform. So they all go in and stand with him on the platform. The next moment was interesting. We followed him into the media room where there was a red carpet and rope area separating the speaker from the press. Only instead of being in the audience, we were with Trump. I felt like this was really their prophetic moment with Trump, and I slipped off to the side. Trump told the confused press group <laughs> that his appearance with his in entourage wasn't planned. This is a great group of, fr of, our, of friends of ours, Trump said, gesturing to the ministers and wives. We just happened to be in, in another room, and I said, come on, let's see the press, Trump said. I actually like them much better than the media. <laughs> uh, Trump immediately thrust Pastor Darrell in front of the microphone with cameras rolling and his Trump hat on his head. And the bishop spoke about being encouraged by Mr. Trump's receptivity to the pastors, to God, and to wisdom. I don't know what type of legislator he would be, said the Reverend Dr. Scott, but I know one thing. Trump is a chief executive, and that's what we need. He's a heck of a guy. <laughs> then Trump motioned with his friend and drafted a starter friend of Daryl's who, ready or not, was up next. <laughs> if Bishop Bloomer was on the fence regarding Trump till then, he had to jump off into the fire once the microphone got in his hand. Here's what Fox News reported. Bishop George Bloomer from Dur Durham, North Carolina, uh, Bishop Bloomer suggested Saturday that his connection to Trump and his firebrand cam uh, campaign rhetoric is a spiritual thing. Bishop Bloomer spoke about the scripture and about fire as a purifying and consuming thing. He said, fire tests and reveals what it, what it comes in contact with. We need a consuming fire in this nation. Some things need to be removed. It's time for us to have somebody bring jobs to this nation and look out for the Christians. Trump's response was as if I, I've seen with other spiritual moments in his life. Revealing. He actually enjoys what we would call spirit-filled or Pentecostal preachers. He wasn't entirely sure what the preacher meant about fire. But what he understood, he loved. Wow, that's awesome. I'm speechless. What can you say? That was terrific. Mr. Trump grew up as a Presbyterian under Norman Vincent Beale. You get the impression he would actually like hearing these bishops preach, which may in fact happen. Trump might be visiting African-American churches in the near future. When Scott suggested he needs to see their houses of worship and meet their parishioners, Pump said, yeah, I got to do that. The press group immediately went to work with their questions. Trump gave familiar answers and some amusing ones. How do you explain your success, Trump replied. I attribute it all to my good looks. <laughs> They tried to bait him with a quote from Ted Cruz, who said he believed he would beat Donald Trump. What is he supposed to say, Donald asked him? Is he supposed to question his own candidacy? He has to say that. I don't consider that an attack. The crowds were ready for Trump, so he waved goodbye and took off for the stage. So he goes to the stage after that. He has his press conference, now he goes to the stage in the arena. Uh, he knows things, it's about to get tough. Trump arrives for the crowd. These meetings energize me. There's like, there's like so much. What is it? It's like a love fest. 
I can't explain it. You can feel the love. These meetings aren't negative. In fact, they're positive. He points to the news teams in the back of the room on scaffolding. We, ha we even have the news media. Let's greet them. The crowd immediately turns in mass and boos on cue. <laughs> Many start to laugh and boo. It's sort of like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. The audience waits for his cues to participate. They, they never report, quote, they never report the crowds. Go ahead, scan the crowd. He's, he's, he's telling the media, scan the crowd. You know, uh, the cameras all stay fixed and defiant. <laughs> What did I tell you? What happens? They don't want you to see that there's 10,000 people there at this meeting for Trump. I saw that video. Can I explain that? Sure. So, Come on. So the video, is, they're shooting only like, say, 50 feet from where he is. Mm -hmm. So you got, of course, you know, 50 feet of people here. You don't see the thousands of people behind him. So he's saying, turn those cameras around, turn those cameras around. He's just, they're just panning this way and panning that way. <laughs> just turn them around, turn them around. So finally turn a little bit to the side, as far as you can see people, as far as you can see. <laughs> uh, they did not want to do it. They just, they just pretend. That's right. They, so you, you think, okay, there's 200 people there. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Thank you so much. They never report the crowds. Go ahead, scan the crowd. The cameras all stay fixed and defined. What did I tell you? The audience and Trump are having a good time. But I have to tell you, get ready folks, he warned his cheering uh, audience, the distortions of the news media and hundreds of millions of dollars in attack ads are coming. Who knows how much damage they will do, said Trump. You get the impression that he knows he is entering the toughest part of his campaign. All media guns are on him, but one unlikely group of pastors is gathering together. It will be a sweet and welcome final insult to the spirit of political correctness, if in the end it is African American preachers who become trumpeters with Trump, I am now trying to return to normal. Flying to Atlanta and New York is tiring and costly, but rumor has it there is another insider meeting in the works staged. So here we have the reports on Donald Trump. And what happens is the media has been doing everything they can to take him down. They said, oh, Trump, Trump has now made his blunder. Uh,